supermarket and I got a package of cut up chicken. Here's what they gave me. I've got two breasts and two wings and two leg thighs. Of course, you can saute it as is, but I like a little preparation. Now there with your drumstick thigh, that's too much for one serving. And besides, everyone likes a little dark meat. Wiggle it like I did. And then that shows you where to cut through. So there's your leg thigh already. Now here's your wing. That would be messy saute that way. Turn, the, turn it akimbo. And here's your breast. You have all of this rib cage here with very little meat on it. And what I like to do is cut that off. And then save this little bit for your stock pot. For a chicken saute, I like to use my crusty, big, heavy-duty, no-stick frying pan. I'm going to set that over high heat. And we want two tablespoons of butter. This is unsalted butter. I think that's the best kind to use because you control the salt. And then I'm going to use one tablespoon of oil. That's either olive oil or peanut oil that I use. And the reason for the oil is that it fortifies the butter so it doesn't burn so quickly. And while that's heating up, dry your chicken pieces. And this is very important. If the chicken is wet, it's not going to brown. It's just going to steam and sweat. I want to make sure that the butter is hot enough. The chicken sizzle as lightly as it goes in. There it does. Now you want to be sure and leave a little bit of space between each piece. In other words, don't crowd the pan and lump everything up. If you do, the chicken will steam rather than brown. Now look at them. As soon as it's browned on one side, turn them over. It will take two or three minutes. You can turn them several times if you just want a nice, even browning. Now the chicken's nicely brown. I'm going to remove the white meat. That means the two pieces of breast and the two wings because the white meat cooks faster than the dark. So I'm just going to leave the two thighs and the two drumsticks in the pan and cover it and let it cook for five minutes over moderate heat. After five minutes, uncover it, turn it on the other side and cook slowly for five minutes more. That's given the dark meat its head start. So now in goes the white meat. And it needs a bit of seasoning at this point. I'm going to sprinkle on a little salt, put on a little pepper, and a herb of some sort. I love dry, fragrant dried tarragon. It doesn't need too much. Just sprinkle that on and shake that up a little bit. Cover it and cook it for five minutes more. That's five minutes. Shake it around to distribute the juices and give it five minutes more. There, 25 minutes in all. That chicken ought to be done. There are two ways of telling. Take your finger and poke it. That feels tender. Another way is to take a little knife and press into it. If there are any red juices, it means that the chicken isn't done. You'll have to cook it a few minutes more. This now is done, and I'm going to take it out onto my platter and degrease the pan. Degreasing just means removing excess fat. And you notice under all this fat, there's some nice brown juices. You want to leave a little bit of the fat in for flavor. Now we're going to make a little deglazing sauce with a tablespoon of shallots. And just a little bit of chicken stock and a little bit of white wine. I always use dry white for booth because it doesn't go off. And just let that boil hard for a minute or two until it's syrupy. Now this is reduced and thickened lightly and it's just full of good chicken flavor. And at this point, if you want to, put in just a little bit of butter, swish it around and when it's melted, pour it over your chicken. That's all there is to it. Chicken with mushrooms and cream, one of the classic combinations and one of the really best, I think. I've got all the ingredients here. Here's a chicken that's just been sautéed, still nice and warm. 
Here's the pan it was cooked in. Its juices all boiled down and enriched with wine and shallots. It's a deglazing sauce, except it doesn't have the enrichment butter in it. I don't need it because I have sautéed, quartered mushrooms, and I have cream. So here go the mushrooms into the pan and about half a cup of cream in there. You want to let that boil up just a little bit. That's fairly thick. I'm just going to put the chicken right in now. In goes the chicken. And that's going to boil up, warming the chicken, and it will thicken as it does so you can keep basting it as it begins to heat through. It'll take about five or six minutes. We just want it warm through because it's warm anyway. Now look at that sauce. See, that's just very lightly thickened so that it coats the chicken when you spoon it over. That's beautiful. Ready to serve. Sautéed chicken with mushrooms and this lovely creamy sauce. One of the great combinations. The thing about mushrooms is that they absorb water like a sponge. If you have to wash them, do so very quickly. Drain them immediately, leaving any sand behind, and then dry them in a towel. If your recipe calls for sliced mushrooms, take a big sharp knife, grab it with your thumb and forefinger, and put your one thumb here and act as a pusher. Use your knuckles as a guide and just chop right down. Now if your recipe calls for quartered mushrooms, that's easy to do. Cut a big mushroom in half and then cut it into wedges like this. To saute about a quarter of mushrooms, you want a nice big pan. And I've got a teaspoon of oil and a tablespoon of butter in there. It's good and hot. Pour the mushrooms in and just shake the pan by its handle. It's very important in a saute that you don't have too many mushrooms in the pan. If you do, they're not going to brown. You can tell when the mushrooms are done because the butter and oil begin to come out and exude on the surface, and now it's time to season them. I'm going to toss in about a half tablespoon of chopped shallots or scallions and toss the pan around, and then a little sprinkle of salt and a little bit of pepper. Give them another toss, and they're done ready to go into all kinds of other dishes in combination with other foods that are absolutely delicious just by themselves. Chicken piperade. Piperade is a Basque term that means green peppers, red peppers, onions, and garlic all cooked together in olive oil. It's a wonderful garnish to chicken. And here's the beginning of it. This is one cup of sliced onions sautéed until fairly tender in one tablespoon of olive oil and there's one cup of green peppers, one cup of red peppers, and a nice big fat clove of garlic. And those should all cook together two or three minutes until they're fairly tender. Well, I think that's tender enough. Now a little seasoning, a little sprinkling of salt, a little bit of pepper, and some fragrant dried thyme. I think that, that must grow in Basque land. Now this is ready for the chicken. We have, I have here this chicken that's sautéed and warm. And here the pan that it cooked in with its deglazing juices with wine and shallots in it. So in goes the chicken. And it's going to finish cooking with the piperade. So the piperade just gets Pour it right over there and cover the pan and let that cook for five minutes. Oh my, does that smell good. Now here it just needs a little basting with the juices to have a little communal flavor here. And it's done. What a wonderful way to bring these Basque aromas to the table. There's a great satisfaction in knowing how to slice an onion fast because we use so many of them in cooking. So here's how. Take a peeled onion, cut it in half from end to end, turn it flat, take a few slices off each end because when we slice later we want the slices to come apart, then turn it so that you can see the ridges of the onion and 
Here's our standard knife grip, our standard hand grip, and just slice right down those bridges. You see that all comes apart perfectly easily. And now diced onions, a few tricks to that too. Here's your root end, put that away from you, and make vertical slices again along the ridges, but keeping them attached at the root, and you'll see why when I do the dice. Now give it a quarter turn and then just cut, gripping it so it won't come, just cut right down through. See, there you are, perfect dice. Chicken Provençal. Provençal is the tip-off that this recipe contains tomatoes and garlic. We start with sautéed chicken, nice and warm, just out of the pan. Here's the pan that cooked in deglaze with wine and shallots. And add two cups of peeled, seeded, juiced, and diced tomatoes. Put in a little dollop of tomato paste. Want a little sprinkling of salt, a little bit of pepper, and a mixture of dried herbs. I'm using Italian seasoning, just about half a teaspoonful, and garlic. Put a nice big clove of garlic through the press and let that cook down. Seasoning is good. I don't think a little white vermouth will hurt it a little bit. I'm just going to put a little bit in there. It's going to be very good. And in goes the chicken. Baste that with the sauce. Turn down the heat. And that's going to warm up and flavor itself. Cover it. And just let it warm through for three or four minutes. Chicken Provençal. And as a final touch, little black olives. Also from Provence. Really fun. And cooking often depends on a few very simple steps which, if taken, make a great deal of difference in the final result. One of these steps concerns the tomato. And if a recipe says, peel, seed, and juice the tomato, do it. It'll make all the difference and it's very easy to do. Have a big, not a big pan, but a pan of rapidly boiling water. Drop in the tomato and let it stay for exactly 10 seconds. Count slowly. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000. And out it comes. First thing is you take out the core and see how easily that skin comes off. Now, to remove the seeds and juice, cut it in half. Squeeze gently. See how easily those seeds come out. If the recipe calls for sliced tomatoes, there you are. If it calls for diced tomatoes, turn the slices around, and they're diced. What could be simpler? Coq au vin, the famous chicken stew in red wine. It begins with Bacon lardons, those are those little pieces of blanched bacon that have been browned and rendered their fat in one tablespoon of olive oil. And in that bacon fat and oil, you saute your chicken. You just, you brown it first. Chicken's nicely browned on all sides. Now give it a little bit of, just a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Give it a little shake again, and it goes into a casserole. And now it's going to be flamed in cognac. This is not a necessary step, but it's fun, fun in flames. That's exactly one third cup of cognac. And be sure you use a good brand of it and then light it. Stand well out of the way. Look at those flames up there. Some people say this is unnecessary, but I like it because it's fun. Let it flame just a little bit to burn off the alcohol. Extinguish the flames, and then in go the rest. There's our bacon lardons. And here's our, these are browned, peeled brown little onions. And a t about a tablespoon of tomato paste. And a nice big clove of garlic. 
through a press. And here we're going to have about two cups of good red wine. It can be jug wine, but be sure it's the kind of wine that you would drink. And that seems like a lot, but the boils off. Then cover it almost to the top with chicken stock. Then cover and simmer for 20 minutes. Oh, that chicken ought to be nice and tender now. Yep, that is, that's done. Now we come to the most important part, which is flavoring the sauce. And the best way to do that is to drain it out into another casserole. And then if it's fatty, you want to degrease it. It doesn't seem to be. And you want to taste it very, very carefully. This is also the time to put in your herbs so that they'll simmer and have a nice fresh taste. I put in a bay leaf and there's a little bit of thyme. Then stir that around and taste very, very analytically and see what it needs. I think that tastes good, but you might want more tomato paste. You might want to boil it down a little bit. And after it's perfectly seasoned, you certainly want to thicken it. And so we're going to use the old-fashioned thickening of a beurre manier. That is just a butter and flour paste mashed together. I'm going to put in about a spoonful there. You use equal parts of butter and flour, and you put, put it off heat and whisk it in, and then bring it just up to the simmer and see how thick it is. Now, the real test is, will it coat a wooden spoon or spatula? Perfect. So now that's ready to go over the, over the chicken. Boy, that smells awfully good, I must say. Now here I have three cups of quartered mushrooms that have been sautéed. That needs to be just basted a little bit, basted all over. Cover it. Let it simmer for three or four minutes, and it's ready to serve. Coco vin. Just smell that red wine sauce. No wonder it's a classic. When a recipe calls for blanched bacon, this is what is meant. What they really want is the taste of fresh side pork. That's almost unobtainable nowadays. So what you do is get yourself some regular bacon but you've got to get the smoke and salt out of it, otherwise that would overwhelm the taste of everything else. Cut it any way that your recipe directs and just simply dump it into boiling water and simmer it for five minutes. Simmering has removed most of the salt and smoke. Rinsing it off in cold water will get rid of the rest. Now dump it out on paper towels, dry it, and it's ready for stews, chowders, braises, and other dishes of that sort. Bone to chicken breast. I like to bone my own, then I do it just the way I like, and it saves me considerable amount of money. And here are some chicken breasts straight from the supermarket. And they have bone in, and bone breasts always have the skin off, so rip the skin off. Hold that in a paper towel, and it off it comes very easily. And then all the bones that you have here is a little bit of the breast bone and the rib bones. And you want to start just cutting against the bone and not cutting against the flesh. You start your boning on chicken breasts, you'll find that it's all easy and it gives you a good start for boning whole chicken too. You don't have to get every bit of flesh off the bone because you're gonna use the bone for your stock pot. So a little flesh will give it more flavor. Now there it is nicely boned. I'm gonna take that off. There's a little bit of a tendon, that white tendon there. And if you leave that in, it will sort of shrink up as the breast cooks. So holding it with a piece of paper is a slippery. Just pull it off, and there you are. Skinless, boneless, chicken breast, ready to cook. Sautéed chicken breasts. Subtle, elegant, delicious. They deserve careful cooking, but they're very quick to cook. I have 
three chicken breasts here, skinless and boneless, and I flattened them out, just like this. Here's one unflattened, and it's between sheet of plastic, plastic, and just pound them, not too roughly, and that flattens them. It breaks up the fibers a little bit so that they won't cook out of shape, and then you want to season it with very lightly with salt and pepper on each side. The other three have been seasoned, and then they're all ready to cook. I have my big no stick pan here, and here's clarified butter. I just want to film that with a little butter. I don't need too much of it. And then I'm going to flour the breasts. And the reason for that, it gives them a little crispness, and it also protects them. And you do this only at the last minute. If you do it too, too much ahead, the flour gets kind of gummy. This is what they call dusting with flour. And those are going to saute just for about a minute on each side until they're very lightly brown, but you have to be very careful not to overcook them. The breasts are done when they're just springy to the touch. If they are a little squishy, that means that they aren't done. And if they're tough and rubbery, you've overcooked them, and that's a shame because they're so good when just properly done. Now I'm going to make a little sauce on about two tablespoons of regular butter in there. And while that's melting, I'm going to put some lemon juice on and then some parsley. I'm going to squeeze the lemon through a towel so you don't get any seeds. And then a little sprinkling of parsley on each one. And watch your butter because it browns very quickly. Then you're going to see this brown butter is going to go over. And watch that parsley. It's going to all bubble up. This kind of cooks the parsley. Isn't that nice? There you are. And serve immediately. Chicken breasts poached in butter. A delicate and attractive way to do them. I have a big heavy pan here with about two tablespoons of clarified butter, and I'm going to roll my chicken breasts in the butter. They've been very lightly seasoned with salt and pepper and drops of lemon juice, and the pan is just very lightly heated. This is really going to be what is known as a butter braise, and I want because I want them to stay white, and because of that, I'm going to put on a protective piece of wax paper because I'm going to cover the pan and they're going to cook in a 400 degree oven and the lid is going to get red hot and the paper protects them, it doesn't let them brown. Set the timer here for exactly eight minutes and go off and do something else. There, that ought to be done by now. And remember, this pan is super red hot, so be very careful, have a heavy pot holder. And take her out, off goes the cover. There's that protective cover, and there they are. Remember, they're done when they're just springy to the touch. So take them out. And you see they have remained nice and white, just as they should be. And there are a lot of nice little juices in there and that lovely smell of good butter. And now I'm going to cover that so they'll stay warm. And remember your pan... That handle is very hot, and the plate I have also heated. I want to make a little sauce for that. There's about a tablespoon of minced shallots. Put in a little bit of vermouth, and then a nice bit of heavy cream. This is a diet recipe, obviously. And then you want to boil that down. It'll take two, three minutes. Now that sauce is nicely thickened in just a few minutes. Now comes the critical point. Taste it very carefully. Mm -mm. That is good. I think, you know, when you're making a sauce with cream in it, just a little bit of lemon improves things a great deal. And then I'm going to put in a little handful of chopped fresh herbs. Swirl it all around. Rush it to the table because that baby's ready to eat. 
clarified butter. It's marvelous stuff to have on hand because if you want to saute something over high heat and you want the good taste of fresh butter, you can't use regular butter because regular butter will burn. You've got to get rid of the milk in it. And here's the easiest way to do it. I'm going to melt three sticks of butter in here and bring it right up to the boil. Now look, it's bubbling and boiling. What's happening here is that the milk is literally evaporating and boiling away. Now it's been four or five minutes, and you can tell by the way it sounds, the butter is stopping to crackle. That means that the liquid has evaporated. You see a final surge of foam, and it's done. If you leave it too long, the butter's going to burn. So you want to strain it out. And look, you see at the bottom of the pan, there you have your, your burned butter speckles, and you have your clarified butter. Chicken poached in wine and aromatic vegetables. It's so delicious. Nobody would ever suspect it was diet food. But it is. There's no fat in it at all. Start out with a heavy-duty casserole. That's about a two-and-a-half quart one. And then we're going to have these julienne of aromatic vegetables. There's carrots and celery and either onion or leeks. Mix them all up together. I've got about a cup and a half of each vegetable there. And then take a third of them and put them in the bottom of your casserole. And then buy yourself a cut up frying chicken and put the dark meat down in the bottom of the casserole because that's going to simmer rather than steam. Now there's a little bit of salt on there and a little herb. I like tarragon, about a quarter of a tablespoon in there. And then cover it with another layer of vegetables. And the white meat, that's the, the breasts and the wings. In that goes a little more salt, a little more tarragon. You can see how quick this is to assemble. And then the rest of the vegetables on top. And this is going to cook in white wine. I always use dry white French vermouth. And it's about a cup and a half or even two cups because the flavor diminishes as it cooks. And then a little chicken stock is to be come up within about half an inch of the, just about like that. You could use all chicken stock if you must, and a bay leaf on top, and bring it up to the simmer. There, now just keep it just at that stage for 25 minutes and it'll be done. Mm, no wonder they call it aromatic vegetables. To julienne vegetables. It's an ancient technique which has recently become very fashionable. Its purpose is twofold. One is to make a dish look attractive, and the other is to give a very special aroma and flavor. These have been done for centuries by hand. Neat matchstick-sized carrots, these are. But if you're in a terrible hurry, you can do it by machine in a food processor. You can see the difference. I'm going to show you how to do it by hand. Let's start with a carrot. I'm going to cut it into a two-inch length. And then you want it to sit solidly, so sh shave a little piece off one side, and then you see it sits, so it'll be easy to slice. And now I'll cut it into very fine slices. Those are about an eighth of an inch thick. And then pile them like this, so that you're not cutting too many at once. And very neat, long matchstick slices. That's your julienne. Now sometimes you may run into a recipe that calls for very finely diced vegetables. That's easy to do. Once you have your julienne, you turn it around, neaten it up, and then cut that into very fine dice. This is technically known as a brunoise. Of course, the more you practice it, the faster it goes. Grandmother would have called the dish I'm about to do chicken fricassee. But Granny didn't cook with white wine, and I do. 
So this is going to be cream of chicken in white wine sauce. And here's the chicken here, which was cooked with aromatic vegetables and white wine, and I've drained out that white wine cooking liquid, which is perfectly delicious. It's right here, rather heating up. And now I'm going to make a cream sauce, a white wine cream sauce, officially known as a velouté. And we've got, I have half a stick or four tablespoons of butter in there, and so I want one third cup of flour. And in that goes, we want to cook that until the butter and flour foam together without coloring. You want to cook that for up to two minutes because you want to be sure and cook the flour. There, see that has foamed up. Now you have to let it cool off. If you add the liquid now, you'll have a lumpy sauce. There, the bubbling has stopped. Now I can add my hot liquid. I'm going to put in about two cups there. Beat it up hard so it's thoroughly blended. This is the secret in the smooth sauce. Just have your liquid hot and then set that over heat and let that come to the boil. That's boiling. Let it boil for two minutes. That cooks the flour. Now that's very thick. You can thin it out with more of your white wine chicken liquid or if you're not too fat, put in a little cream. This is up to you for this point. See, the cream whitens it and gives it a lovely smooth taste. Now it's time to taste it very, very carefully. It ought to be delicious. It is good, uh, but I'm going to put a tiny, thing, tiny bit more salt in. Better to put in a little at a time, a little pepper. And that's done, ready to use. Here's our chicken poached in aromatic vegetables and white wine. And exactly the same sauce you just saw being made. And here is the same chicken, but taken off the bone and diced and covered with the same sauce. It's perfect for stuffing preps or patty shells. It makes a lovely chicken pot pie. of broiled chicken, I think of crisp brown, beautiful skin, tender, juicy flesh inside. It's a beautiful way to do a little bird, I think. And here is a nice little bird, a broiler fryer. And I've taken the backbone out of it, or get the butcher to take it out for you, and then turn it over, and you want to flatten it out. Just take your fist and cruelly pound it. That breaks the rib cage so that it's flat. Then turn the wings akimbo, and then to make a neat little package, slit the skin at either side of the breast and stick the end of the drumstick through there. And then the same thing on the other side, and you'll see how attractive that is. There. Now I have an oil pan, just squish the oil about in it, squish the little oil over the flesh into the pan and a little bit of oil on the top of it, and that's now ready to broil. You notice I've put this chicken in a flat pan because I want to conserve the juices, and I've got the broiler rack down in the lower third. The broiling element is red hot, and this is flesh side up, skin side down, and I want to leave it with the door ajar for about four minutes. I can't emphasize enough how you've really got to give a broiler Tender Loving Care, TLC. It needs basting about every four minutes. That's just the beginning base, but you should start right in. I've got a little melted butter here. And do that about every four minutes for a total of 12 minutes on this side. Now that, that's been about 12 minutes, and this looks, oh yes, that looks nicely brown on that side. I'm going to baste it again, now that with the accumulated juices in the pan. And I think it also needs some seasoning. You notice there's a little bit of salt. You notice I didn't season it before because I think it makes the juices run in a home oven. That's a tiny bit of dried thyme. Now I'm going to turn it and cook it on the other side, where it's going to need 12 minutes more. 
Ooh, that's fine. With just as much tender, loving care. I'm going to baste a little bit of that. And then back she goes under the red hot broiler. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what broiled chicken should look like. Brown, glistening, and beautiful. One way of adding variety and zip to broiled poultry and meats is to finish them off with a mustard and crumb coating. That's called a la diable or devilish. Anything with mustard is devilish. And I have here some little Cornish game hens which have been broiled and they're almost cooked through and they're still warm. And here's the pan they cooked with. Here's the juices they rendered. And here's the devilish mustard here mixed with a little bit of shallot and rosemary. And I'm going to take some of the pan juices and a little bit of that fat and beat that in because that's going to make the coating. So that liquefies the mustard. And then you just paint that onto the your little game hands just onto the top. You know, this seems like an awful lot of mustard, but when it's done, you would really hardly know that it had gone on. So don't be squeamish about putting in a little mustard. If you have a little bit left over, you can use it for something else. I had about a third of a cup there. I probably could have used a fourth, but it will always be useful. And now some nice fresh white breadcrumbs and be sure that those are fresh. Don't ever use those bottle dry ones because the fresh ones give such a difference in texture and flavor. Now they go back into the pan. And I think half of a game hen per person is, is enough. And then baste them with a little bit of those nice juices. And those are ready for the broiler. About four or five minutes is all they need. Now that's been about five minutes. Yes, they're done. Look at those breadcrumbs, brown and crisp. And that mustard coating is going to give them a devilishly good flavor. If you've never roasted a turkey before, looking at this great big animal, you'd say, gosh, what am I going to do with that? But actually, it's very easy to roast a turkey. What we have here is a 14-pound turkey, all ready to go practically, for, except for a few things. We have some fat in the cavity there, which you should pull out, and then look in there, and there's a beautiful turkey neck. And then turn it around in the front, and you hidden into this pocket is your little treasure of turkey giblets. And that is, you've got the gizzard, and you've got the heart, and you have the liver. You want to save all of that because that's going to go into the turkey gravy. Now, this is almost ready to roast, except you've got some nubbins here on the wing. Cut them off because you can't eat them. And I'm putting that into a pot because we can boil them up for our turkey stock. Put the nubbins in there. We'll put the neck in there. And the gizzard in there, and the heart. And then I'm going to put in some cold water just to cover them. There, that's enough cold water to cover my turkey neck by one inch. I'm going to bring it up to the simmer on top of the stove, and that's going to be the turkey stock for our gravy. And while here, I'm going to start the stuffing. This is one... This is one half pound of sausage meat, which I've just browned nice. And I'm leaving the fat in the pan, and in it, I'm going to cook until tender two cups of chopped onions. There, those are done. They're tender. That took about five or six minutes, and now I have two cups of chopped celery. Those should only go for two or three minutes, because I want them to remain a little bit crunchy. Good, that's just the right consistency. Here it goes in with the sausage. Now we, I have here two quarts of white breadcrumbs that have been toasted in the oven and then tossed, tossed with four tablespoons of butter. That makes them very nice. Two eggs, and the, 
eggs are going to hold the stuffing together, just beat them very lightly. In they go. Mix it all up. Now we're going to have seasonings. This is a very simple stuffing. This is about, I'm going to put in about half a tablespoon, half a teaspoon of salt, and about half a teaspoon of very, about, about a teaspoon of very fresh, nice sage, and quite a number of gratings of pepper. And then you want to toss that up and taste it very, very carefully for seasoning. You notice there isn't any liquid in here. There doesn't need to be because you have your eggs. And taste that very carefully. I think that's delicious. I'm going to put in a tiny bit more sage. No, no. Lovely. Now, turkey's ready for stuffing. You start stuffing the turkey at its neck end, and I find it much easier to plop it into something like a big bowl. And the, you put the stuffing in the neck end first. And do not ever stuff a turkey until just before roasting because the stuffing can spoil, particularly if it has breadcrumbs. It begins to, I don't know, it just begins to turn. So be very careful about that. You can get the stuffing made, but don't put it in. Now, to hold the stuffing in the neck end, in goes just a skewer. It's one of those little things you can get at the market. And now, turn it unceremoniously the other end up. Not very, not very dignified. I think it would be horrified to know that it was being stuffed from this end, just sitting this way. Now you don't want to overstuff it because it's going to swell a little bit. Is that enough? A little bit more. And I always like to have a little bit left over, so I have a little more than I need. And now I'm going to take it out of its support and we have to have to hold the stuffing in you can either put a piece of bread or just a piece of aluminum foil then you take that out after it's roasted but it holds the stuffing in very nicely now the turkey's ready for trussing I think it's essential to truss any bird because it just looks messy with its legs flopping around now f get yourself a piece of cotton string, find the middle of it, fold it in half, and then stick that middle underneath the tailpiece, cross the string over the tailpiece, and then twist it under and around one drumstick and under and around the other drumstick. And then flip over your bird, and there's your string coming up over the back. <coughs> Now go over the shoulder, and then catching the wingtip, go under the armpit. Then again, over the shoulder and under the armpit. And then tie it. I always forget how to do this, so I'm very glad to have it permanently on tape. And tie. And cut off the extra. And you're ready to roast. There's that little piece of, they're awfully messy, really, I think, the way they clean these birds, but maybe that's why they're so inexpensive. Stick a little skewer in there to hold it. And then I'm going to oil it. I don't use butter on a turkey because you baste it so much and there's so much fat, I think you're just wasting the butter. And I'm going to oil, this is, I'm going to put it in the pan, this is the rack. Noisy rack, but oil that so that the turkey won't stick onto it. And I'm just going to, with my hands, rub underneath the turkey to oil that. And there it is in the pan, ready to roast. Now I've got my oven here set at 325 degrees, and you'll note the time 207. This turkey will take about four hours to roast. And I want a one-hour leeway, so we will have dinner at 7.07. .07. So in it goes on the lower rack in the oven. And I'll be back in about 20 minutes to baste it.
that's been in a little over 20 minutes. And I'm just going to rapidly give it a baste. It's a very good idea to keep looking at it and baste it every 30 minutes rapidly so your oven doesn't cool off. And then just checking on it just to make sure everything is right. So I'll be back in half an hour, honey. As the turkey stock comes up to the simmer, you notice a lot of gray scum. You want to skim that off. And you have to do that two or three times and then let the turkey stock simmer for about an hour and a half to two hours, very lightly covered. And that's all there is to it. So I'm making a little giblet gravy. This is the liver, which I'm just sauteing in butter just enough so that it has a slight springiness. You don't want to overcook it. And then I'm going to chop it up. And here, you remember we had the gizzard and the heart, which were simmering in the turkey stock. And I took them out when they were just tender. You see that liver is still a little rosy. That's when it has its best taste. Just chop that up. And then I'm going to return everything back to the pan for a tiny saute. And then they'll be added to the gravy. There. That just gives them a little extra taste. Let's give them about a minute. Now that's been in around three hours. It's time to baste it again and also to put in some aromatic vegetables. Just give that a nice basting with the pan juices. And now I have a, about a cup here of chopped carrots and carrots and onions, and those are going to flavor the juices so that we'll have a really nice gravy. That's going to take about an hour more, and if it begins getting too dark, cover it loosely with foil. Now that's been four, about four hours, I think this turkey should be done. I'm going to take its temperature. And there's an instant meat thermometer that should go into the thickest part of the breast. You want to wait two or three seconds, and that's got to register 160 degrees, which it does. So our birdie is done. Turn off the oven and get to the gravy making. There, isn't that? That's really is beautiful. Lovely and brown. I think the easiest way, rather than fussing around, just to lift it off with uh, paper towels. And here's the rack in the pan here, and all these lovely, lovely juices. I'm going to put that in the sink. And I'm going to push this turkey up here and deglaze the juices. You know that turkey stock we made? I'm going to pour that in and then scrape up here. Be sure that you've got any coagulated brown flavor in there. And now, I want to strain this. This is always rather awkward, but there isn't any really any easier way to do it. Ooh, that smells good. You know, those vegetables I think make a great deal of difference. Now you still have, and you still have juices in these aromatic vegetables, so. Press them to get all the juice out. And now, that's beautiful gravy stock. You have to now start the rather long process of degreasing it. So just tilt your pan and just skim off the top of that fat. That'll take two, three minutes. Now these turkey juices are beautifully degreased and they're ready for the next step, which is thickening them. And I'm going to thicken them with cornstarch, which is a light thickener. I've got three tablespoons of cornstarch in there, and I'm going to pour in about three tablespoons of port wine. When you're using cornstarch as a thickener, adding it to a hot liquid, you must mix it with a cold liquid or it will lump up and get that thoroughly blended. And then in it goes into our turkey juices. Stir them up nicely. And now I have as an additional treat for the gravy, those are our, that's our giblets, our gizzard and liver, which have been sautéed. And I'm going to pour this liquid right into them. 
That's going to make a beautiful sauce. So you want to stir that over heat until it comes to the simmer, and then it has to simmer two minutes to cook the cornstarch. Here's our big, beautiful brown roast turkey. Here's our gravy. Now, is there an expert carver in the house? When you know the techniques of roasting a turkey, you'll find that almost any other bird is roasted in exactly the same way. Little details differ timing and temperature, but on the whole, it's exactly the same like the pheasant. A luxury bird, a little bit dry, but it has a nice gamey taste. Here's a beautiful big old roast chicken. I just love them succulent, juicy flesh. Little birds like game hens and squabs, they're all roasted in the same way, really, except for the duck. The duck is a bird of a different feather entirely. If you roasted a duck like a chicken, you'd find if you had nice, juicy breast meat, that the legs were tough and almost raw. And if you had the legs done, the breast would be well overdone. And if you're just interested in crisp skin, you'd have shredded, horrible, dry meat inside. So you have to use an entirely different system when you tackle a duck. This is a four to five pound young duckling. And the first thing I do to one is to chop the wings off at the elbows. These have very little meat on them. They're tough, but they make wonderful duck stock. The next thing I like to do is to take out the wishbone because it makes the breast much easier to carve. You can feel the ridge of it there. Take your little knife and cut all the way around it. Now just pull that out. There it is. Save that for the stock pot. Now here's another very nice trick to make carving easier because ducks are difficult. The second joint is attached to the small of the back by some tendons and you want to cut through the tendons you can do it right from the back end. This is not going to hurt the duck. You can wiggle that and you can feel where it is and just go in there until it's entirely loose. See, that's entirely loose there. Do the same thing on the other side. Now, for the wings, you want to disjoint them from the shoulders, but you do it from the inside. Wiggle it until you feel the joint and then cut through it. See, that's really cut through. That's going to make carving so easy. Do the same thing on the other side. Here's our duck at the door of the oven. I'm just pricking it through the skin to release some of the fat as it roasts. It's been lightly salted inside, trussed with string, using about the same system that you use for the turkey. Here it goes into a 450 degree oven where it is to stay for half an hour. Half an hour is up. Time to do something to our duck, which is this time now. Look at, all, look at all that fat in the pan. You've got to get that out. So just suck out as much as you can with your bulb baster. It's about enough. Now look at that. It's almost half a cup of fat, and there's more to come. But because the oven is so hot, it's going to keep on cooking at 450 degrees. There's a cup of water on the top of it. That's going to minimize the fat smell and also help melt some more out. And there's a, a mixed cup of chopped aromatic vegetables. That's going in at for 20 minutes more, still at 450. Now, after 50 minutes in the oven, I've removed the duck, and the breast is done, but not the legs. So I've removed the legs. As you can see, they're still tough and they're almost raw. It's probably all that swimming makes them tough. So now they're going to go back into the oven for 20 minutes. Now the next step is to remove the skin from the duck. It just peels off with a little urging. Now I've cut that skin into strips. Now I'm going to season it very lightly with just a little pinch of allspice there and a little pinch of salt. 
and that's going to cook in the oven with the legs. It'll take about 10 or 15 minutes. Keep your eye on it, and then they will crisp into cracklings, and you'll have your beautiful brown duck skin. Now I'm slicing the meat off of the breast of the duck. And I'm putting it into this buttered pan that has a few chop, chopped shallots in it. And it's interesting that this is a four pound duck, but it really doesn't serve more than two people. Now I'm just warming these through. I put a little bit of about a quarter of a cup of duck stock in there. I'm sprinkling them with a little bit of Madeira, and they should be only warmed through. Now they're just warmed through. You don't want them to overcook. I'm going to arrange them nicely on a hot platter. Here is the pan that duck breasts were warming in. I've reduced the juices and swirled in a little butter. They're almost ready to serve. There are brown skin cracklings, our perfectly cooked legs, our beautiful breast meat, and here's the sauce overall. That's the way to cook a duck. Well, I hope you've enjoyed poultry, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this six-part series we call The Way to Cook. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit.